Okay, we've talked about, you know, the predecessors to arcades, you know, the actual term for arcade or, you know, the parlors and the, the gambling halls and other places that kind of had all of these influences into arcade games. And then we talked about the history of video games a little, you know, the computing, the computing rooms, you know, with Alan Turing and the Bletchley uh, Park people. And then we have, you know, this MI, this railroad club that invented terms like hacker and bug and you know pretty much everything you think of when you think of computers they really started and then you have you know coming from there this combination of arcade uh games made from japanese who really uh japanese game that or company that really started to re-influence the arcade going you know we we, we can make these new machines and started to get others to make machines like it and so they, they started to, to rebuild and and started to make uh, arcade games. And the very first major arcade video game was Pong. And then I said, you know, actually at this point, arcade games kind of differ depending on where you are. So I thought I would talk about the arcade games in the world or the world arcade, how it differs from the way uh, somebody in the U.S. would view it. So here we go. The first thing you have to point out is that the concept of gambling and the concept of an arcade game are not different in the minds of other cultures. On the left, we have a, uh, a thing for Blackpool. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But Blackpool is a major resort in England, and it is one of the major influencers in English uh, arcade culture. In the center, we have a pachinko machine by... Uh, Tishbeina, uh, Tishbeinhan, or Tishbeina, Tishbeina. Okay. Uh, who's a German who happened to be going through uh, Japan and took this picture, and then on the right you have you know Circus Circus. The reality is arcade games started in casinos. They started in gambling halls. They started, you know, not as family friendly, but they started to separate themselves in america they started to make these new concepts and new ideas that no these these games are for you know the entire family they're very family friendly and families are going to really enjoy them and you know they had these family entertainment centers and they said okay you know we're going to we're going to push this away you know we're going to have most of this is for kids and this will entertain the kids while the parents go and you know grab something to eat or drink a beer or uh go shop somewhere else <laughs> but they would do this in hopes that you know it would become family friendly and so a lot of the kids growing up in the u.s never realized that there was this other influence in there by the time arcade games became video games video games became so popular that they started to you know push out uh casinos and gambling games i mean think about it you play a game and you never expect a monetary reward that is perfect for somebody who wants to run a casino at one point casinos were getting rid of all of their gambling machines and moving in arcade games or moving in video games as fast as they could because that made more money and had zero payout than regular gambling so if you go to a lot of the older um, casinos like circus circus you will find an arcade area a video game area when I was at Circus Circus, it was actually on the second floor, and I've been told that some of these machines have a lot of problems because there aren't a lot of people that know how to fix those machines uh, left. And so it was really sad when I went there. But <clears throat> arcade games are very different because in Japan and in England, gambling is part of the arcade culture. You have to accept this as you move on. So it's not an arcade separated from a casino it is a casino arcade okay we're going to go into uh, some history here there is a museum in Moscow entirely dedicated to um, Soviet era arcade games the Soviets were desperate to keep their officers you know entertained and entertained various people so they saw these arcade games being sold in the 60s and 70s and yes many of them were uh japanese in, in style 
and they were like, you know, we, we should make these games. We should make our own games. And so they imported a bunch of games, looked at these machines, how they worked completely. And since they were mechanical, they could figure it out, you know, wire by wire to make their own versions using their own technology and using their own light bulbs and stuff and built their own arcade games. And so, you know, you would go into the officer's mess or you go into certain areas and you would find arcade games. And the, this museum is dedicated to keeping this, these machines still around. Though they do have a problem because, you know, the parts are slowly running out and they're having to figure out, what am I going to do now? But look, you, you see a lot of games that you would have enjoyed during that era. I mean, there's football, foosball. There's the hockey game. Oh, I loved that as a kid. Uh, the basketball game was actually introduced by uh, Sega, but it became major in the U.S., there's a periscope game, a uh, driver game, a <laughs> punching game. They had all sorts of games that you could play. And this is something that the Soviets, you know, we, we talk about the Iron Curtain and how they treated people, and it, all of that is accurate. But they also recognized that people were getting bored and they needed something. So the Soviet arcade was spread because people saw the other side and they said, you know, we could do this as well. And because of this, they influenced, um, you know, how video games were made or introduced the concept of video games. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Or into uh, the Soviet Republic. And I, I kind of wonder if Tetris would have existed if it wasn't for, you know, these Soviet arcades. Okay, now we're talking Blackpool. I want you to look at the picture on the left. And there are tons of amazing pictures from... Blackpool, from what I understand, it isn't doing as well, but at one time, almost every place you went into was a major arcade. Now look into this area. You see a little fishing game. That's sort of an arcade game, though it's being used for uh, gambling. There's there's a horse betting game. There's, I think, another horse betting game. There are one-armed bandits, but there are also regular arcade games off in the background. They're all, you know, working together because in Blackpool... None of this is different in the minds of the people playing them. These games are for kids because you're not going to get any monetary reward from it. But, you know, they're, they're fun games. And the same way, and this is a, a kind of a casino uh, resort area. And from what I've been told, this is kind of run by local gangs. And, you know, they'll claim they made so much money. And then, you know, how much they actually made is unknown. Stuff like that. But... You can just see how this arcade is a beautiful uh, gambling hall and also arcade. And how Blackpool is a major influence. And you, when you go into any resort area, you'll find the same thing. Where you know, arcade games will be in the same area as the gambling hall. Because in the minds of the English, there is no difference. And <clears throat> that was a real shock for me. Because when I saw pictures of arcades... I was not expecting to see a bingo hall. I was not expecting to see, you know, a Wheel of Fortune type thing. I was not expecting any of this. And when I, I told people this, they were just like, no, no, this is a regular thing. And look, see, there's the video games and there's the, the gambling stuff. I mean, what are you talking about? Of course, there's the, there's the video games. And I'm like, no, no. In the U.S., you don't have any of the gambling stuff at all. I mean, you might have a ticket machine and that will only be used to pick up prizes and those prizes are going to be junky just in case somebody says it's gambling because in the u.s a separation between gambling and uh skill based is a major thing whereas in england it really isn't the the law just lessened up and said okay just just do what you want and because of that you now have places like uh the pictures you see that's uh families going there and having fun and the kids are in one place, and uh, the parents are in, uh, in another, and that's how life is. This brings us into Pachinko. <coughs> in our minds, in, in this big thing of upset people, they say that Konami has given up on the video game culture of the that they have created. They have, they have made Pachinko and gambling machines for Silent Hill and for Castlevania and for other stuff. How dare they? Don't they understand that video games are not part of gambling? And the reality is in Japan, 
they're the same thing. And in case you're wondering, yes, the story of pachinko machines being used at, for uh, Yakuza is totally a thing. Uh, you kind of can't escape the Yakuza when you look into uh, video game history. Even the, the companies that have worked really hard to no longer be Yakuza were Yakuza at one time. And so Konami made were, were making more money off of their uh, machines like this. By the way, Sega has admitted that their gambling machines, uh, their gaming department, <laughs> yes, really, uh, has made more money off of uh, gambling than their uh, arcade department or any of their other video or their video game department. So uh, <laughs> you have to understand, in their minds, this is the same thing. It's just a different way of looking at it. You put in your coin, you hit a, a thing, and, you know, a thing happens. I've been told that the pachinko machines and these gambling machines actually offer greater uh, reward than just a possible monetary reward. I guess I should point out, I, since you're listening to this and you don't, you may not know this, in pachinko machines, you aren't gambling because you don't actually win anything. You, you get more uh, balls or you get more tickets. And then you take these tickets and then you, you take these balls and you go over to uh, a vendor and he gives you a prize of some kind. And you take that prize and you go over to uh, a place across the street and you trade that prize in for money. And in, oftentimes the prize is a really tasty chocolate bar. And <clears throat> this is the way the, the people run gambling halls by separating the 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 monetary reward from the uh, game playing area it's a thing but it's run by the same people and in their minds there is no difference between video games and gambling not a joke the uh the picture on the right those are all pachinko machines they are actually in a street called akihabara which is supposed to be the major video game and geek area. But really, it's, it's just a bunch of casinos with video games in them as well. And nobody in the U.S. really thinks of that, thinks of it that way because they don't, they, they separate the two. Uh, many arcades are being taken over by the pachinko machines in Japan because the pachinko machines make more money. Also, these gambling machines offer more than just a small reward you know instead of a little ball for you for your reward you you put in a coin and you have a character doing something and be, based on where your balls landed are what's are what happened next I've been told stories about little old ladies going in and putting in coins and they're just watching this story as it takes place you know will he choose this well you got two oysters and a uh, grapefruit so that means he did not choose to treat that girl nicely and she rejected him. And, oh, his heart is broken, but he doesn't understand why he acted that way. Oh, what will he do? He, he should talk to her again. Oh, put in that coin. Oh, pull the trigger. And, oh, you got two grapefruits and a chocolate bar. Oh, oh, he talked to her. And she said, oh, well, maybe maybe we should meet again sometime. But not, not right now. And, you know, you want to know more, so you put in another coin. And you're basically watching a story, and you're paying for it a quarter at a time. And so the Japanese uh, say this is a major moneymaker, and it, it sounds like Netflix, only it's in a gambling hall. So you have to realize that within uh, Japanese culture and within many other cultures as well. <clears throat> another thing for those of you who are of certain age you were born in like 2000 2001 and beyond and after that you don't realize that arcade games were everywhere in when i was a kid i would go into the grocery store and there was just near the front there were just arcade games and i would just beg my mom for a quarter so she and she and she would give it to me because it got rid of me while she was shopping and she was like he's he's being taken care of and it only cost me like a buck so, you know, yeah, here you go. Here's a buck. Go play, you know, your little Strider game. Enjoy yourself and come back, you know, when you're done. And, you know, I did do that. I love Strider. <laughs> a true story. 
and you, you would go into you know a pizza restaurant pizza hut and you know right at the front there were arcade games right there ready to be played and you were like oh while we're waiting for a pizza let's drop in a, a couple of quarters oh then you go into, into a burger joint and oh hey here's this machine near the front okay dropping in a couple quarters uh my favorite or my favorite video game area in uh, one of the towns i lived in was a 7-eleven and they had a neo geo machine a street fighter machine and i believe a mortal Kombat machine yes they did it was mortal Kombat 2 and you know i i ended up playing the neo geo machine enjoying samurai showdown more than anybody else but you would just find these machines everywhere you went oh uh gas station yeah there we are oh little restaurant there we are and it was just everywhere it was ubiquitous to find arcade machines and i couldn't find any real good pictures so here's a picture of uh, grand theft auto san andreas with an arcade machine that's pretty much how it felt you know just near the front you would find an arcade machine and you'd be like yeah i've got a quarter let's do this okay now we're getting into uh chinese culture in china they are wow is that a Oh man, no, it's a candy cab. Ah. Oh man, this is actually kind of painful to watch. Uh in China, they have a major uh thing where where people will make uh copies of machines and they'll sell it for a lot cheaper or they'll make a substandard product and yeah, that's kind of a famous thing from China. But they've started to really grow because of it. And China is now the major uh, video or arcade uh, arm in the world today. And if you can go look at, you know, the Japanese, what the Japanese are doing, and usually it's it's mostly gambling, but some good games. And then you look at, you know, what the U.S. is making, and it's usually amusement rides and VR machines and stuff like that. But you look at the Chinese, and the Chinese will have like. 300 new games and you know all this cool stuff and it'll remind you of you know the arcade games you enjoyed as a kid plus rides plus this and it's just a really cool idea but they had to save face a little because they're like oh man people are people are noticing us that you know we've got all of these shoddy machines so the chinese government rounded up as many uh fake arcade machines as they could and burnt them to the ground <laughs> And that, that was kind of their sign that, you know, we're, we have emerged. We are ready to, to join the world of arcades. We are ready to become major video game people. And I've got to tell you, this is actually kind of painful to look at because those are fun games. I mean, is there shoddy stuff there? Is there stuff being stolen? Hey, look, it's Bruce from uh, uh, Finding Nemo <laughs> on the left, way on the left. But um, they didn't care and then finally the chinese government went no no we're, we're starting to become more legit we're going to burn all of these machines down we're not going to let these machines ruin our reputation anymore and that is kind of how the culture of arcades has really been today is they take these things that we really enjoy and once they hit a certain uh reputation they kind of pretend like they didn't have that bad reputation back in the day and you know it's still there but they pretend like it isn't there anymore and you have to when you're a historian you have to admit like oh yes this was started by this oh the kabuki theater was a real major influence for japanese arcade oh and it was started by a uh, by a brothel oh you know, a lot of the, the money that went into the original arcades, yeah, that was the mob. It was it was a money laundering scheme. Or it was a gambling, it was pure gambling. And they were just claiming it was for skill. We have to accept this as part of the culture. And uh, <clears throat> what a lot of people in our modern times try to do is they try to look at it and go, no, no, it doesn't exist. I'm burning it to the ground. This This will not be, this is my history and I'm proud of it. So I'm just not going to talk about the bad history, but I don't want to do that. And I want, I want that to be acknowledged. And let's see if there's any more. Okay. So next week I'm going to be talking about um, books to read uh, and websites to check out 
if you want to get into uh, this research a little bit more. Uh, thank you, and this has been a great week. Uh, hope you guys all have a good weekend. Bye now.